Before the land was settled, glaciers pushed down from the polar cap, inching across the continent, grinding out a great valley. The ice turned a broad river from its northward flow, turned it south to cross the continent. Later, men named that river the Missouri. Early men lived upon the prairie for what it would yield. These were the Sioux, Arikaras, Assiniboines, Crees, and Crows. They were of the land longer than any other. The spirits of the wind, of the buffalo, and of the coyote were a part of them. The spirit of the great blazing sun made them part of the prairie. In conquest of the continent, a great migration of restless men came to the Missouri Valley from the east. At first the lone trapper, then hunters and traders. Adventurers came for riches. Others came to escape civilization, and their lawlessness stained the plains with the blood of many men. Then the surveyors came with measuring chains and field books to record the geometry they imposed on the face of the land. Men measured and divided but nature's forces governed the prairie land. The great plains between the wetlands to the east and the Rocky Mountains to the west did not easily yield up their riches. It took time for men to comprehend the vastness of the open plains and the strength of the wind. The settlers came with dreams. Here was land on which to make homes of their own. They came as cattlemen, sheep herders, sodbusters. They were the settlers. The Great Plains became theirs with their signature upon a claim, with their sweat and their lives. Some built homes a prairie sod. Among the many men who understood the Plains suffer intimately was Harvey Dunn, the well-known South Dakota painter. He put on canvas the colors of the prairies. His paintings get to the heart of the matter, to the feeling of the pioneers. He shows the magnitude of creation seen from the plains, the loveliness of the vast prairies, the subtle beauty of wild flowers, the wind and the silences. His paintings reveal the feelings of the early settlers as they entered the vastness of the prairies. He understood their hope and excitement at building a home. He recorded clearly the fear, hope, and loneliness are seen in the faces of his pioneer women. Perhaps the women felt the loneliness the most. From the comfort of towns and villages in the east, they came to the vast stillness of the prairies. In letters to families left behind, they spoke of the silence of this unsettled country. Unfamiliar, it seemed to them to be a deserted wasteland of grass. In their former homes, they had wood for their stoves. On the plains, they learned to collect and burn buffalo chips. The men broke the prairie sod to make their farms. For most, it was the fulfillment of a dream to make a new beginning, to be their own man. In the early morning, the settler would go to the field. His eye would lay out the fields he dreamed he would harvest. Then the oxen leaned heavily into their yokes and the plowshare opened the prairie for the first time. The land was becoming part of the man, and he was becoming one with it. A man could dream of abundant crops and good prices as he plowed alone in the field. He could make plans for a barn or a real house when there was time to build one. He spoke to his oxen in gentle tones as he thrilled to the knowledge that it was his place. He urged the oxen on. The plow sank deep into virgin sod. Grassland became farmland. The pioneers came in droves, encouraged by land companies that printed enticing advertisements promising a land of milk and honey. They were hauled west to the plains by railroads wanting to sell land and increase freight business. The settler was encouraged by territories and states seeking to build population. Many settlers came from the east or from Europe. They came from the wetland regions which their ancestors had farmed and understood for generations. 
The settlers brought old knowledge to the new region, but this was a different land, and new lessons were to be learned. Life in this new place was rigorous. Cold blasts of winter roared across the prairie with terrifying fury, the blizzard. In mid-August, lightning streaked into the dry prairie grass and a wall of fire would sweep across the land, prairie fire. There was unpredictable weather, periods of drought. The sun baked the plowed soil to a fine dust. Then high winds blew it away. Newly plowed soil eroded away, carried down the Missouri River in spring floods. Pioneer strength was not always enough to make farming a success on the Great Plains. The faces of the settlers showed the worry and hardships. In some areas, the 160-acre homestead was too small to support a family. The plains were not suited to cultivation in the same manner as eastern farms. Crop failures followed crop failure. There was often not enough water. Settlers gave up and sold out. If the weather and the nature of the land did not discourage the pioneer farmer, the economics that governed farm marketing did. The farmer paid high freight rates to get his products to processing centers to the east. He was often unable to get credit to expand farming or merely continue for another year. The plain settler will always be remembered in our history. He was hardy and resolute. His women were enduring. But the era of the Plains settler passed. The Great Plains are a semi-arid prairie. Difficult to farm, it was still home to the early Plains farmer and rancher. To the eastern investor, banker, freight hauler, it was too often a colony where raw materials could be bought cheaply and manufactured goods sold at good prices. Farmers throughout the nation, resentful of starvation farm prices, and rebellious against systematic exploitation by special interest groups, organized political action groups to win for themselves a fair shake in the marketplace. Rural people found that in organization there was strength. Listen to what they said early in the 1900s as they sought change within the democracy of their land. Without organization, you will be as helpless against the man who would prey upon your efforts as one man would be against an army. And another said, we put organizers in the field and said to the farmers, here now, you're a Democrat. You have been voting as a Democrat all your life. Your neighbor has been voting all his life as Republican, and another neighbor as a Socialist, and another voting as a Bull Mooser. But the trouble with us is that it don't make any difference which party is in power. We are in the same boat. We don't get anywhere. To help solve farm problems, cooperatives were organized to serve mutual needs. One cooperative leader talking to farmers said, we organize on a nonprofit basis and a cooperative basis. The association cannot make a penny for itself. Everything that it does is to serve the grower. Every director has to be a grower. Then all the interests are a community of interests. After the few good years during the first two decades of the 20th century, there came drought and serious decreases in farm prices. Finally, the Great Depression brought a crushing blow to the entire nation. In the Great Plains, drought and dust storms came too. The effects were devastating. Mortgages were foreclosed, entire families drifted to the cities or the West Coast to work as migrant labor. They had lost their homes. The economic crisis brought quick action from President Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration. New federal legislation stepped up soil conservation programs, sought to bring production into line with demand, relocated farmers on more productive land, stimulated research to improve seed, made low interest loans. The Agricultural Adjustment Act, the Commodity Credit Association, and the Farm Security Administration all sought to save the family farm and salvage the agricultural economy. In the upper Great Plains, the burning sun, dust storms, and crop failures took their toll. People had to learn that in this area, water was especially important. The need for comprehensive planning of water resources was apparent, and conditions in the 1930s increased the demand that wise use be made of rivers and streams. With development of water resources in the Missouri Basin, the first regional planning for the Upper Great Plains began. Planning and development had to extend beyond state lines. 
had to consider the Great Plains as a natural region. Men were learning that the river basin has a unity of its own. That unity governed the development of the plains. The construction of the Missouri River dams began with Fort Peck in Montana in 1933. The other main stem dams, Garrison, Hawaii, Big Bend, Fort Randall, Gavin's Point, were started in the late 1940s and completed in the 50s and 60s. The six Missouri River main stem dams are all operated by the Army Corps of Engineers. The Bureau of Reclamation markets the power generated in the dams over a vast regional high voltage transmission grid. The dams and transmission grid were the first major developments of resources on a region-wide basis. The dams controlled the floods that had devastated large areas of the lower river basin. The savings in human lives as well as property will repay many times the cost of the dams. The dams made it possible to regulate the flow of the Missouri River, ensuring a reliable source of water for use by cities and towns along its banks. Navigation on the lower reaches of the Missouri was made possible. Vast reservoirs behind the dams were partly dedicated to irrigation projects planned for the future. Garrison diversion in North Dakota and the Hawaii irrigation project in South Dakota, both authorized by Congress. Irrigation of millions of acres of fertile prairie land promises new crops for the region, a more stable agricultural economy and greater economic diversity. The great reservoirs of the Missouri also provided increased recreation for the people of the region. Easy water access to rugged and remote areas of scenic beauty was made possible and the propagation of waterfowl benefited greatly. The power production for the dams is the cash register of the Missouri River Project. For example, over 80% of the cost of the irrigation is paid from power revenues. But most important for the development of the upper Great Plains, was the availability of low-cost power. Low-cost electricity opened a new era for agriculture on the Great Plains. The blessings of electricity had been enjoyed by farmers in more densely settled parts of the country 10 years before rural people in the Great Plains were able to put aside their coal, oil lamps and lanterns. Because the prairie was sparsely settled, the private companies would not provide electric service to people who lived in remote areas. There was no profit in it. The Rural Electrification Act of 1936 set up the low-cost financing required to get electricity to rural people. Loans at low interest rates were offered to consumer-owned cooperatives so that people themselves could build lines and deliver electricity to their farms and homes at prices they could afford. Farm leaders went down the country roads from farm to farm to collect the $5 membership fee to get their local rural electric cooperative going. The members held meetings to elect directors to run the cooperatives. Trained people were hired to manage their cooperatives. The rural electrics brought electricity to nearly every rural home, not just the large users, but everyone. Area coverage, they called it. It opened a new market for home appliances and electric tools for farm shops. Rural life was changed for the better by running water, refrigeration and clean, safe electric stoves and house heating units. The doubters questioned where electricity from the Missouri River dams would be used. But the Plains farmers' need for low-cost electric power to run machines and tools, as well as household appliances, made rural power requirements increase by leaps and bounds, doubling every eight to 10 years. So great was the demand for low-cost electricity that by the late 50s, the Bureau of Reclamation said that it was going to run short of power. In the early 60s, a deadline was set, and the Secretary of the Interior told the cooperatives to find new additional sources of power by 1965. Energy from the prehistoric past lies in vast quantities under the sod of the Great Plains. The region was once a marsh-covered, subtropical expanse where prehistoric monsters roamed huge primeval forests. After millions of years, the carboniferous materials became a soft coal we know as lignite. By burning underground lignite veins, were considered to be of the spirit world and avoided by the Plains Indian. Meriwether Lewis of the Lewis and Cook Expedition noted along the Missouri River layers of the brownish substance that burned. Old tunnel mines attest to pioneer knowledge of this fuel. Many people living today remember vividly the pungent odor of lignite burning in their coal stoves, and they also remember the constant job 
of removing clinkers and carrying ashes. But this fuel was not used in large amounts and there was no industrial use of it for a long period. Small local electric generating plants used lignite. Some of it was shipped to Minnesota for use in relatively small quantities. The first large scale use of this valuable resource was made because of a region wide effort by rural electric people. To solve their needs for more low cost power once the dams on the Missouri River could no longer supply the additional amounts, rural electric cooperatives made extensive engineering studies on the use of lignite to produce low cost power. After many meetings, 67 local rural electric distribution cooperatives and their wholesale generation and transmission cooperatives organized Basin Electric Power Cooperative. Today, there are eight generation and transmission cooperative members indicated on this map and a total of 100 distribution cooperatives. As a regional power supply cooperative, Basin Electric was assigned the task of producing large amounts of low cost electricity and delivering it to its member systems throughout the region. In 1962, REA Administrator Norman Clapp approved a $36 million loan to Basin Electric to build the first large-scale lignite burning generating plant in the region. In June 1963, under the flags of eight states to which the power from this new plant would flow, national and regional leaders broke ground for Basin Electric's Leland Olds Power Station near Stanton, North Dakota, named after the former chairman of the Federal Power Commission who devoted his life to protecting consumers' interests. Leland Olds urged the Great Plains Rural Electrics to join together to build giant plants from which their consumer owners would receive low-cost power. Assistant Secretary of the Interior Kenneth Holm told the 8,000 people assembled for the occasion about the benefits of the contract between Basin Electric and the Bureau of Reclamation. The extra capacity in the federal high voltage transmission grid would be leased to Basin Electric for about $1 million annually to enable the cooperative to deliver power to its members. The federal hydro facilities would supply power to Basin Electric's consumers when the lignite plant was shut down for maintenance or repair. Regional cooperation on a broad basis involving several federal agencies and the 100 farmer-owned cooperatives was a reality. The giant power plant is a major industrial development for the Great Plains. During its construction, hundreds of rural people who are the actual owners of the plant because of their membership in a member rural electric cooperative came to North Dakota to see this example of Great Plains development. Engineers and technicians from all over the world have visited the pioneering plant during its construction and operation to study how lignite can be used successfully in a large generating plant. At the time of its construction, the 216,000 kilowatt North Dakota plant was the largest in the Western Hemisphere to use lignite as a fuel. It is three times larger than any lignite fueled power plant built up to this time in the United States or Canada. It represents the first attempt to use on a large scale the Missouri Basin's huge lignite fuel resources. To serve the needs of this plant, large-scale strip mining was begun in North Dakota. Modern mining methods were employed to remove the 30 to 60 feet of earth which covered the lignite seams. 4,000 tons of coal a day are burned in the first unit of the Basin Electric plant, and it takes mammoth equipment to keep the coal moving. Once the lignite is mined, the earth is returned to rolling countryside where grass, shrubs, and trees are planted. Over one million tons a year are required to keep the plant operating at full load to supply the 265,000 farms and rural homes served by member cooperatives. How long will this fuel last? How cheap is it? These are vital questions to the people working to develop the Great Plains. This drawing, illustrates how vast are the lignite deposits in the upper Great Plains. The small cube seen here represents the million tons required annually by one generating plant of 200,000 kilowatt capacity. It would take 100 years to burn a cube only a fraction of the large cube illustrated. About 150 of these giant cubes represent the estimated lignite resources. Although much of the lignite is not commercially recoverable, the region is estimated to have about 400 billion tons of lignite below its surface. This basic fuel, one might say, is nearly limitless, a vital source of energy with which to develop the Great Plains. 
cost? At the present time, lignite costs less than half as much as fossil fuels available on the borders of the region. As a fuel, it is still very competitive with nuclear power. Continued large-scale development of lignite for power production will assure the entire upper Great Plains the low-cost energy it needs for greater development. Modern machines, including modern electric tools and on-farm processing machines, have made the United States farmer the best producer of food and fiber in the world. Today, the average farmer produces four times as much per man hour as in 1910. The Great Plains is one of America's major food producing regions. For example, those farmers who own and get their electricity from Basin Electric's member cooperatives produce nearly 20% of the nation's wheat. They grow 82% of the Durham wheat, which is used for spaghetti type products. They grow 19% of the oats and barley in the United States. They provide the nation with about 12% of its cattle and sheep, 9% of its corn, 56% of its flaxseed. 24% of the sugar beets produced in the nation are grown by these farmers. Food production for the nation depends on an abundant and increasing supply of rural electric power. Because farmers still face the persistent problem of high costs and diminished net income, their rural electric cooperatives are striving to help by keeping down the cost of this basic source of energy. Through Basin Electric, they seek the lowest cost source of electricity to meet constantly increasing requirements. To supply the additional electricity farmers and rural people in the upper Great Plains will need for the next 10 years, Basin Electric will construct a 400,000 kilowatt generating plant as an addition to its first unit in North Dakota. This giant plant will be operated in coordination with the regional power system. Through the Missouri Basin Systems Group and in cooperation with this electric power pools 120 public and cooperative power systems, the output of the Basin Electric Unit will be coordinated with the hydroelectric dams operated by the Corps of Engineers. The output of these facilities is transmitted over the joint transmission system operated by the Bureau of Reclamation. To deliver the output of the giant plant and to help assure reliability of the regional grid, Basin Electric will build extra high voltage transmission lines as part of the region-wide joint transmission system. Also participating in the comprehensive plan to coordinate power production in the upper Great Plains are the power suppliers of the Nebraska Public Power Systems. Consumers Public Power is constructing an 800,000 kilowatt nuclear power generating plant on the Missouri River south of Omaha. The nuclear unit and the Basin Electric unit will be tied together with the 345,000 volt lines to be built by Consumers Public Power District, the Bureau of Reclamation, and Basin Electric. The creative regionalism illustrated by this coordinated planning of electric power resources in the upper Great Plains will help develop the agriculture of the region, will keep down the costs of power to rural people, and will encourage development of business and industry. Instead of moving to already congested cities, people will find jobs created in the upper Great Plains. Cooperatives in eight states of the Missouri River Basin are working with the Rural Areas Development Department of Basin Electric to help local communities grow and to encourage local industries large and small. In addition, these cooperatives and Basin Electric work with the development agencies of the eight states to encourage economic growth. Projects such as a new potato processing plant, a small farm machinery manufacturing plant, and many others have received technical assistance from the development specialists at Basin Electric and its member cooperatives. In this manner, the rural people who own and control their local rural electric cooperatives are working with progressive people in the region to bring about great economic development. The prairie is our garden to cultivate with care, to nurture for its people. It is a productive part of the nation. Its fields are fertile if cultivated with understanding. Its water resources are great if conserved and wisely used. There is water beneath the surface for pump irrigation to sprinkle crops. There are minerals to mine and lignite and oil for fuels. There are educated, hardworking people. Cooperation among all segments of the population can make this region economically strong and progressive. Low cost power is essential for development of the Great Plains, whether in agriculture, small business, or industry. The rural electric cooperatives are pledged to providing this vital energy to their member consumers. 
They are dedicated to helping develop this region, to cultivating this prairie, which is our garden.